so thank everyone for, uh, for coming out. And um, so uh, we're, of course, in some really interesting and, and exciting times uh, right now because of social movements that have developed. Uh, we had the foreclosure crisis, we built all kinds of movements. Uh, uh, and then we have the, uh, the Occupy movement. Uh, and now we are in the midst of the movement for black lives and some of the amazing work that people are doing around that. And I think, I suspect we're gonna have a few more movements uh, uh, coming up, or these things that we generally call movements, uh, we refer to as movements. So uh, uh, one of the limits I think that we have, however, in this time, is the uh, seemingly in, seeming inability of organizations to get together in the U.S., social justice organizations, and uh, agree on underlying analysis of the issues that we're confronting, uh, and then develop objectives, broad, far-reaching objectives based on that analysis, and then specific demands that we can go after that are uh, robust demands and that would, would uh, would uh, either significantly transform certain segments of society or would heighten contradictions which then would set up for the transformation of society. Uh, and so our inability to do that, I think, is harming uh, launching social movements. And it means that a lot of the energy that we're right now spending uh, protesting, uh, organizing meetings, uh, engaging in meetings, and taking arrests, as well as putting our bodies on the line, uh, is, is not being maximized because we are uh, not clear on what our analysis is of the problem, uh, our objectives that we have in order to solve the problem the specific demands that we have. So we want to spend some time talking about that, uh, laying that out. So we want to spend a, uh, the early part uh, talking about the analysis, the uh, early part of my talk talking a little bit about the analysis, and uh, which we covered last time that, uh, that I was here. Uh, so we just won't spend too much time on that, but um, do want to go over the analysis and then talk about community control of the police as a concept, black community control of police as a concept. And then uh, we then shift to is then what a campaign could potentially look like here. How do we build a movement to win that demand? Assuming that's the kind of thing we want to have or to advance that objective. Um, so in this time right now, we have uh, rebellions happening all around the world. We have some rebellions that happen here in the United States in Ferguson and in Baltimore. I suspect we're going to have a few more, which will, uh, uh, which will come up. And as a result of those rebellions, we had a social justice movement that swept in and gave some level of clarity, uh, or gave at least gave some voice to what the level of frustration or anger that people who were engaged in the urban rebellion were, uh, were trying to express. And so uh, we were able to clearly define, I think as a social justice movement, a whole series of things that we were against. So if the urban rebellion then was raw outrage and saying we're outraged by what's happening and we're outraged by these killings and, and by the way that we're treated in the society, if the urban rebellion represented raw outrage, then what the social justice movement was able to do once sweeping in uh, uh, is to, was to uh, uh, give a list, sometimes clear, sometimes not so clear, but to provide a list of the things that we are against or the things that we oppose, the things that we're not happy with in society. So a bit of an evolution from raw outrage uh, uh, we went from just expressing our outrage over to uh, clearly expressing the things that we are against, and that was a significant evolution. So instead of just saying I'm angry and overturning chairs, which is important to do uh, in some contexts, we're then able to say these are the things that we oppose. We oppose police brutality, we oppose the criminalization uh, of youth, we oppose the criminalization of black communities. So that was a good move, but it was not enough. And what we need to get to is not just list the things that we are against, but to be able to forcefully, clearly articulate the things that we are for. And if we're talking about organizing, you can mobilize with the things that you're, uh, when everyone is against the same thing, but organizing requires everyone to be for the same thing. And we can't build movements just based on what we are, certainly not strong movements, I think there's certain movements that can be built. We can't build movements just based on what we are against. We must build movements that will take power. We must build movements that will transform society based on a collective vision and dedication to what we are for. So that's what we have to gain clarity on. Uh, so we want to then build a social movement that could uh, articulate what we're for, and again, that happens with the underlying analysis, and then create a uh, set of strategies and tactics that could actually win us there. So, um, uh, uh, so in terms of under underlying analysis, uh, we, I think the social justice movement in general at this time uh, looks at the um, uh, the level of police brutality that black people are facing in this country, including the video that went viral uh, yesterday or the day before with the young girl in class who was using her cell phone and the teacher uh, uh, ordered her to give over her cell phone. She refused. 
So the teacher called in an assistant principal who then ordered the cell phone and then wanted to, her to leave class. She refused to get the cell phone. She refused to leave class. She wanted to stay in class, actually, uh, because she was looking at her cell phone. She refused to leave class, and so they called the police on her. And the police, of course, with very little hesitation, flipped over her chair and basically uh, assaulted her. Uh, so we're looking at these, and I think the overwhelming consensus inside of the social justice movement is that this is fundamentally a problem of racist police or racism or racial prejudice. Uh, we think that this is a faulty analysis of what the problem is and will ultimately then lead to faulty objectives and faulty demands as a result. We don't think that the core problem is uh, either racism or racial prejudice. So first we want to split up uh, and clearly identify what racism is. We would identify, we would uh, define racism as racial prejudice plus power. So you have to have both of those things in order to have racism. Racial prejudice plus power. So racial prejudice would be an idea, an attitude, a disposition uh, to, for, uh, uh, of one race towards another, or even inside of a race, uh, would be a, uh, an attitude or disposition. And the power is the ability to put those attitudes, dispositions, or opinions into play. So there are, I'm sure, sorry, this is there are, I'm sure, uh, African people who are living in the bush of Tanzania or in Kenya or wherever it is in the world, or even for that matter, in the inner cities of uh, Chicago or Madison, who uh, hold racially prejudiced views about whites, who members of, of uh, the Nation of Islam, for example, uh, are taught that white people are devils and uh, that they're not a devil or kind of devil, but they're actually the devil. And uh, so that's part of the teaching. Of the, there are people who believe that deeply. There are people who are African people who think that white people are inherently evil. Um, uh, and so you have somewhere right now, again, in the bush of Africa, a, a, at least one black person who hates white people with a passion. And you can say has racial prejudice towards white people. What difference does that make in a white person's life? None whatsoever, because that person has no power to institute what, even if they wanted to, for example, uh, uh, kill or destroy the lives of, or exploit the labor of white people, has no power to do that. Stokely Carmichael, who was the first one publicly who said uh, black power, uh, said, if a white man wants to lynch me, that's his problem. If a white man, however, has the power to lynch me, that becomes my problem. The real problem with racial prejudice, as it were, is not uh, the racial prejudice in and of itself, but it's the power to implement the prejudicial ideas. That is the real uh, impact. And because, uh, uh, th therefore, we think that the fundamental problem at stake is not the racial prejudice component of, of racism, which I think is what we kind of shorthanded for in this society, uh, but the power part. So if we were to launch, if we were to say that the underlying analysis of the problem is racism, and because the problem is racism, and again, racism as a shorthand for racial prejudice, we would say the problem, underlying problem is racial prejudice, then the only possible campaign we could take on is a campaign to end racial prejudice. And that's what we say all the time in the marches, uh, you know, get rid of the racist police, those are some of the demands, don't allow racist police in the police force, <coughs> stop racism and racism. If, if, uh, uh, there's a number of problems with that as an analysis and therefore as a demand. Uh, if we were to launch a movement, to launch a movement based on the idea that we need to end racial uh, prejudice, uh, and, uh, uh, to end racial prejudice, then black people in the society who are the victims of racial prejudice would have virtually no role in that movement at all. It would not be either our job to go and end racism inside of the white community, which is really where it is powerful and exists, or would we be able to? The last thing racist white people want to do is see a bunch of black people knocking on the door trying to organize them to end racism. Uh, it's not certainly not something I would want to do. I want to organize inside of the impacted community uh, the community impact about racism, not by not go and organize the races. But let's say even we're able to get a bunch of white allies to go and organize other white people to try to end racism inside the white community. What would that look like? We would have to convince millions of white people to spend tens of thousands of hours laying down on the psychiatrist's couch to explain to them how they came to their racist beliefs, <coughs> prejudices of beliefs, and then try to work through them in order to beat them. How would we even know if that campaign was successful? How would we measure that? There's no way to measure it. It becomes an illogical campaign, not just an illogical campaign in terms of the ability of black people to participate in a campaign that's supposed to help them, uh, which there are, our ability to participate would be limited, but it's an illogical campaign in the sense that we'd not be able to measure its victory in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't make sense to do as a campaign. The real issue is not the racial prejudice part 
uh, 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 of, of, of racism because that part, again, is entirely irrelevant when those who, who hold those racial prejudice, racially prejudiced views have no power to implement them. Uh, the real issue, then, is power. Power is the fundamental issue. And on power, we say that the black community in the United States, black communities in the United States, effectively operate as domestic colonies. The fundamental relationship between a metropole and a colony is that the colony exists for the benefit of the metropole. The metropole is able to control that colony. It's physically separated from. Traditionally, we think of colonies as separated by vast uh, land or vast uh, uh, oceans. But in this case, they're not separated by that. But uh, where they're physically separated, and then the metropole is able to go there and extract labor and extract raw resources and extract other things from, uh, uh, from the colony. Uh, and we have basically two sets of land, the metropole and the colony, but only one governing structure. The metropole governs the metropole, and the metropole governs the colony. And we think that is the exact same thing that happens inside of the United States. The core problem is then that the black community is not, it's not that the black community is facing racial prejudice. The problem is that the black community is enduring colonial status inside of the United States. And our real task then is to end the colonial status. And the power in the United States, power in the, in the uh, equation of, of, uh, of racism looks like uh, uh, a domestic colony, and therefore we have to end the domestic colony. We have to end colonialism, domestic colonialism inside of the United States. That becomes the role not to end racial prejudice, not to end racism uh, among whites. And then if, after ending the domestic colonial relationship, if we're able to get power and control our own communities, the racial prejudice that exists inside of white communities would become irrelevant to us. Not that it would become unimportant, because racial prejudice not only is harmful for those who are uh, victimized by it, but also harmful to those who are holding those beliefs. Their beliefs of the world are inaccurate, uh, they're backwards, and, and ultimately it ends up limiting their own the capacity of the racists to, uh, to evolve to their full human status, which we want to see everyone, uh, everyone evolve to. So then the real issue then that we have to confront is the domestic colony that is uh, black communities inside the United States. That is what we have to build a movement to end not a movement to end racism. Uh, part of that then is recognizing the critical role that police play in having a domestic colony in the, in the United States. The colonies are not voluntary relationships. They are relationships that are built on oppression and built on coercion. And the way that coercion happens in, when you look at colonies in the traditional sense is that an occupying army goes and occupies a territory and uses their weapons and their, uh, and their brute force in order to subjugate the, uh, uh, the, the people who are living in the colony and uh, to control them. Uh, and then to maintain peace and order there so that the metropole can continue to benefit from the unequal relationship. In the same way, the police forces in the United States serve as occupied armies inside of our communities. In a 1967 speech, uh, where do we go from here? Martin Luther King said a significant problem in this country is that the in inner city ghettos are effectively domestic colonies of the United States. Martin Luther King said that. In the 1960, uh, later in that same year, 1967, out came the book Black Power, in which it fully described as, a, as the premise of the book that the black community is a domestic colony inside the United States, and that's the relationship that we have to end, the relationship that we have to overturn. Uh, and recently, uh, a couple of years ago, former, the, the most former, uh, Attorney General of the United States, uh, Eric Holder, said that too often police act like uh, an occupied army inside of the uh, uh, black communities. This is a uh, well-understood metaphor and well-understood reality uh, in many circles. And, uh, and this is ultimately what we have to stop now. And that is a measurable uh, task that we can see, we can identify, and we can say this is something we can overturn, this is something we can solve uh, in our lifetime with a fully developed campaign. So then the demands for this time then have to be, uh, cannot be centered around ending racism. The demands for this time must be around ending the occupation, ending the occupation of black communities by the police force in the US. And the way we're gonna end the occupation is to demand that the police who right now occupy our communities without any benefit to our communities then leave. And then those local communities would then be able to control the police themselves.
That was the only way we could get some kind of semblance of, uh, of justice from the police, is if the police work for the communities which they, uh, uh, which they patrol. So uh, there are many people who say, of course, that there are a series of laws that we have to change in order to have the police uh, behave differently towards black communities. Uh, uh, we do think that there are some laws that can and should be changed. There are certainly laws that just make good governance sense. Right now, you can find almost any uh, municipality or county uh, in the United States, you can go sometimes even online, and you can find the exact number of parking tickets that that municipality gave out over the last year or even the last few months. So you can say, you know, Miami, Florida gave out 10,000 parking tickets. This was the total amount that they took in. These are the amounts that are still not paid yet. Some of that information is available online. You cannot today say with any level of certainty the number of people murdered by police in the past year. You can't say with any level of certainty the number of times the police have discharged a firearm in the past year of any municipality. Because even those who report are not required to report uh, accurately. And if they don't report accurately, there's no real penalty in place for that. So those laws should be changed, uh, not because they, they shift power, or not because they make some big contribution to uh, uh, ending uh, discriminatory behavior or ending brutal behavior, but just because it makes common sense and makes for some level of the governments. If we're put, paying tax money uh, for these forces, People should know that. That makes uh, complete total sense. Uh, with that said, <clears throat> uh, we don't think that, that the, we should engage in a series of individual changes of laws or getting additional training. The reality is the, uh, the police are not shooting black people because they're not well enough trained. If they were not well enough trained, then they would also be shooting all kinds of white people. But they're not doing that. They're treating white people with, with uh, uh, an incredible degree of deference uh, and, and humanity, quite frankly. Uh, which we'd like to see in our own communities. There was a, uh, a couple of recent stories, uh, one which didn't get much traction, I'm not sure why, but this was in, uh, I want to say it was in Central Florida. Uh, there were two young men who were driving around, teenagers, they wouldn't use their names, there was a news story about this, they wouldn't use their names because they were minors and they blotted their faces out. But they were driving around in a pickup truck and drinking beer in the pickup truck and they're videotaping each other driving and drinking uh, and then posting it on their own social media accounts. Uh, and then they would pull over on the side of the road, again, in rural areas, and they would walk out and they start shooting, you know, inside the woods and shooting at, uh, at rocks, you know, they would march on the rocks and then shoot at the rocks. And this was like, they're putting this on their own social media accounts and the news is showing this. And the, uh, the, the news, the people, uh, the newscasters are becoming increasingly irate. So look what they're doing, they're doing the narrative, they're shooting, they get back in the car and they're drinking beer. And then in the next scene, of course, in, in this, the guy takes a swig out of his beer while the car's going, the guy in the passenger seat, and he sticks his gun out the window. And while they're driving by, you can see a police car is there, so he's pointing his gun at the police car, and they're laughing about it. So this is like, okay, the hammer is getting ready to drop on these kids, right? Uh, they interview the, the Fraternal Order Police Chief, the Fraternal Order Police uh, Representative, uh, and he said, this is an outrage, these kids don't understand the, uh, the significance of their actions, they're being disrespectful. Uh, uh, and uh, then they finish up the story by saying the police had a stern talk with the kids and their parents, and they all agreed that the parents are going to punish them for what they did there. This is an incredibly, I think, humane response to two kids acting like complete and total idiots. Yeah. Right? Uh, if they were black, however, I suspect that they would be in prison right now. And they would be, well, they would be dead, possibly. But, um, uh, but we had two cases that in Georgia, this was in, in Central Florida, two cases in Georgia uh, with two women, uh, black women, who were uh, of war, uh, 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 I guess black nationalists, but certainly uh, uh, radical in their thought, who would yell and scream and hoot and holler at their computers. One woman in particular uh, pointed her gun inside of her own house, pointed her gun at her own computer screen, at her own laptop, because she was recording a video for her own social media, and said, we should shoot white people on the point of her gun at her laptop. And she was arrested for, and is in prison right now, and is waiting trial for terrorism. She had like a million dollar bond or something like that. And being charged with terrorism. She pointed her gun, not at a police car while drinking, but at her own property inside of her own house where it was legal for her to have her own gun, which is registered to her. She's not being charged with any legal bond. Uh, so the way, I don't think that the, that at any point in training school did they say, if a black woman points her gun in a, at her own computer and then arrest her, a white kid goes and points a gun at a police car and they don't arrest them. At no point did that happen in any of the training. 
uh, because the real point is not the training. And if we fix the training to address that, it would just manifest itself in some other way. The training is not the issue. The training is not the problem. I'm not saying the police anyone shouldn't get any training, but the training they're getting is not the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is that the black community is seen as a threat to the white community. And the white community controls the police, and so not only is the police doing their job by protecting the white community from the black community, but the white community as a whole applauds and rewards the police when they engage in this kind of, of, of rough behavior with the uh, <coughs> inside of the black community. And they would punish, by contrast, the police if they behave the opposite way, the, the same way inside of the white community. And the police know where they get their rewards and where they get their punishments. If the police were under the control of the black community, then we would be able to reward them and punish them in the exact same way. So our task then at this time, as a movement, as organizations, as individuals who are interested in advancing the cause of justice, would not be to try to fix these white police officers in terms of their racial prejudice, it would be to try to fix structurally the system of power and remove the system of power that now rewards police for occupying one community uh, in order to protect another community and instead uh, uh, punish them for doing that and conversely reward the police who treat communities as holistic uh, bodies that need help and support. Uh, uh, so I think that is what we need to be moved toward is, to, is towards shifting power fundamentally from the, uh, uh, at least as it relates to police, of course in other areas also, but this moment provides an opportunity for police, fundamentally shifting power from white people controlling police inside the white community and white people controlling the police inside of the black community to black communities controlling the police inside of the local communities. Uh, now there's some discussion about what we then we do about uh, black, uh, uh, white police controlling, uh, uh, police controlling, uh, white people controlling police inside of their communities, what that means for black people driving by. At least in the short term, we'll mean that we're treated the same inside of white communities then as we are now, but at least we'll be treated as uh, uh, better inside of our own communities. It would also remove then the built-in reward for black people when they make it to move out of black communities. Like black success is, uh, is, is regarded as when you have enough money that you can leave the black community and go to white communities. And that's rewarded in a number of ways socially, but certainly in the way that you get treated by the police. Uh, uh, because they're always afraid that, you know, mistreating black people in white communities, or that if that happens, that if they live there, then there's going to be some other kind of repercussions. So uh, then that would no longer be the case. There would be an actual reward for staying in the black community, uh, being black, being successful, and staying in the black community, rather than all the rewards uh, following you when you leave, rather than staying with you where, where you are. So with police and occupied force, then, we end the occupation and say that black communities <coughs> must have control of the police in their, uh, uh, in their own communities. And uh, ignore the issue, not ignore the issue completely, but certainly in terms of, of launching campaigns, ignore the issue of racial prejudice or racism, as we'll call it, and fight instead for actual power over the police. And by granting that power over the police, we would make the issue of racial prejudice irrelevant, and we would then be able to use the police force the way we want. Now, when we launch a police inside of uh, control police in black communities, we of course would not want to replicate the exact same police force that we have right now. We want to create a new police force. Uh, in fact, we think that once it's launched and once it's operational in the way that makes sense for our communities, we would no longer even be able to call it the police force because it wouldn't look anything like what the police force does now. So now, uh, in terms of the priorities of the police, the priorities of the police uh, in, uh, in most places are to protect private property. And so you have downtown, uh, the police are then responsible for protecting buildings from homeless people and make sure that homeless people are not allowed to sleep in them, make sure homeless people are not allowed to urinate on them, make sure that homeless people are not allowed to otherwise uh, uh, bother people who have access to the, uh, to the building. Uh, because the priority of police then is to protect private property. If communities said, however, we're not, all, we're not overly concerned with private property, we're actually more concerned with the individuals uh, who are in distress and say that we want the police, instead of arresting people in order to protect the building, that we protect the people who are forced to interact with that building because they have nowhere else to go, uh, then that would change the behavior of the police dramatically. Uh, a lot of communities, as we discussed this, say they would like to disarm the police. I don't think we would do that completely. I wouldn't, wouldn't want to do that completely for a number of reasons, the main reason being what happened in South Carolina. We don't want some group of racists coming into our communities knowing that our police don't have any guns and doing whatever they want. We'd have some response for that. 
Uh, but we do want to, we do think that the vast majority of police work has no, or what, we, what we would call police work, has no need whatsoever for any kind of weaponry, uh, and therefore we would need to have police forces that are armed to the, uh, uh, armed to the team. Um, uh, so the police force then we would deconstruct the very notion or concept of what police is and would reconstruct as something entirely different. There, where there would be a force who would protect our community, uh, just like any army would protect its own uh, country, uh, and then uh, it would also then uh, protect the people and serve the people who are inside of it. And not in the serve and protect way that we talk about now, but in a real significant way, because the power then of the police would be, instant, would be rooted in the community in which they're doing their, uh, their work. So uh, we would then would need to be, build a movement that would be firmly uh, rooted in certain principles and objectives, uh, we think that there would be four major uh, principles that would then unite and build this movement. The first is that we would need to enforce the human right to self-determination and informed consent. Self-determination and informed con consent are well-recognized, well-documented human rights, and included in some of the uh, human rights uh, documents which the United States has uh, become signatory to. Uh, and if we recognize the right to democratic self-determination, uh, uh, and democratic informed consent, uh, we can certainly make the argument that community control over police is an integral part of that. There has been no time in U.S. history that the black community has, it has uh, provided informed consent to the police occupying our communities, certainly not in the way that they do now. Uh, and we think we, uh, it's high time that we have a referendum on that, on whether or not this is the police force that we want to have. The second uh, principle and objective around which we could organize and build this movement is community control over police as an expression of uh, the human right to uh, self-determination and force uh, consent. Uh, the third one around which we would build this movement uh, would be that the movement must be led by the most impacted communities. So that is to say we cannot have the black middle class aspiring to become the black uh, ruling class lead a movement uh, that is based on uh, police abuse of low-income and no-income black communities. So if we have a, uh, a movement uh, based on abuses that are happening to low-income black people, uh, to uh, queer folk, and uh, disproportionate uh, uh, sexual abuse of women, then we have to have uh, movements that are led by this exact group, uh, by this exact demographic. So we can't have a movement that is, uh, uh, that is fundamentally uh, working or lower economic class that is led uh, or populated by uh, higher economic classes, people who don't face these kinds of problems on a regular basis. Uh, and then the fourth one, in terms of building a movement, would be that we'd have to have positive action centered demands. And positive action, of course, most people call civil disobedience. We have a, uh, uh, or civil disobedience or direct action. We have a particular definition of what this means. We're not going to do that uh, now. But we'd have to have a, uh, uh, have a social movement. We think the only way that it would work is if we engage in direct action as a means of achieving the objectives that we have. Uh, so these would then be the principles and objectives around which we must build this movement. Uh, and getting to that point where we can uh, agree these are first on the analysis that the real problem is co uh, domestic colony, not racism, uh, and then that these should be the guideline, uh, the guiding principles for movement building, and then developing the full objectives and demands for the movement building around community control of police uh, uh, as a root would require a significant level of ideological and political clarity, and that is going to mean. Uh, struggle where we would have to engage individuals and organizations in ongoing political education, in ongoing debate and discussion uh, about where we are uh, as a movement, what we think is good analysis, what we think is bad analysis. We have to go through this process. This is a process which is not fun, it's not as exciting, this is not a process that's going to be caught on TV, this is not a process that's going to be, that's going to lend itself to sound bites, this is going to be a long and grueling process, but we have to go through it because we can't actually win the other things unless we deal with this. There's no way we can come up with good, successful uh, uh, demands that make sense through and through, that don't, that lack, uh, that don't lack internal logic without going through this process of figuring out internally what we, uh, the way we perceive the problem and the way we, uh, we see the solution. Uh, so movements don't spring up overnight. They're a long time in making. The roots of the civil rights movement uh, ultimately, we think, lie, uh, started in the, uh, in the 1940s. Uh, and this up, uh, 
Uh, even though I think we, we're going to historically think about this particular time, the movement for Black Lives that started with Mike Brown, it actually started way before that. Uh, and so we need to think about what the uh, what the start of it is, not so much to, uh, to to document, but so we can understand some of the genesis and the direction uh, uh, in which it's going. The protests that we've had during this time have been fantastic. The protests that we've had during this time have been exciting, and they've been extremely brave. All around the country, people blocking traffic. Right here in Madison, the incredible images of young people uh, uh, sitting out and laying out in front of the Capitol here have just been amazing and inspiring. Uh, blocking uh, traffic, confronting the police, stopping Christmas uh, shoppers. This, that has been, to me, something I never thought I would see. Uh, and I think that was not only uh, uh, bold, but also really brave, given how uh, people get about Christmas shopping. Uh, uh, the problem has not been that. The problem has not been people's willingness to engage in uh, an incredible acts and brave acts in order to pursue their objective. The problem has been we have not, had, uh, we have not developed clear objectives that we're pursuing. So if we would have engaged in all these incredible acts, uh, and as after, at the end of this process of engaging in these incredible acts, someone would have got up and negotiated the deal and said, OK, we've got, we want our demands, no matter what they would have come out with, it seems like a majority of the people would have been unhappy with whatever the victory was. But that's only because when people went into the action, we didn't have a clear idea of what the demand was. We had clear ideas about what we were angry about, police shootings, et cetera. We had a clear idea of the list of things that we, we didn't like because we evolved from just urban rebellion over to a social justice movement led um, a mobilization against all these things that we don't like. But we didn't have a clear idea of what that meant then we should get in exchange, uh, what that meant we should win. Uh, and I think we saw a very similar thing right here in Madison a few years ago when we had the mass takeovers of the Capitol in response to Scott Walker's uh, attempts to, uh, uh, to change uh, and stop uh, the right of collective bargaining uh, for workers in the, in the state, certainly for state workers, uh, but for workers in the state. And you had mass movements which were opposed to that. But as those mass movements opposed to that, and I think everyone universally, at least people working uh, people, uh, opposed those uh, those moves, maybe not as many people as we thought because he was voted back in and he uh, uh, voted back in. But while uh, we had uh, uh, a lot of uh, people who were against that, certainly willing to go out and, uh, and oppose that, we had a huge segment uh, of that uh, population who went simply to oppose those things, simply to say we want to retain, go back to the status quo. And what you had a significant, but probably not a majority of people who said, we don't want to go back to the status quo. The status quo was not actually good for us. Under the status quo, we're poor. Under the status quo, we're getting beaten up by the police, the police who were fighting now for their rights to get uh, uh, collective bargaining. Under the status quo, we had you know, unequal access to education. And the status quo, we didn't have an effective social, social safety net. So even though everyone was fighting against the same thing there, we we're not all trying to get into that space fighting for the same thing. And I think the identical, um, a problem, the identical dynamic is playing itself out now, even inside of the movement of black lives, where we are engaged in incredible and amazing actions because we oppose something in particular, but there's not a level of clarity about what we actually want to win. Which raises, of course, a significant dilemma for us. If we engage these actions and we win, then what happens? What are we doing then? Where they say, okay, we give up, we will meet all of your demands, we, we then would have to start the discussions about what our demands actually are. And you're supposed to do that before you start your action not after you actually been successful. Um, so yeah, so I think we need, to, we need to now evolve the movement from just these incredible and beautiful expressions uh, and hashtags and emotional appeals, which are incredibly important, and the cultural support here for a movement building is incredibly important. We now need to elevate that to, to then get to the point where we have clear objectives and uh, demands. So we then think that we can develop uh, meaningful campaigns uh, to win the community control over police, so long as we had a few things in place. So we want to talk a little bit about what movement building would look like in this context. So if we had as a, uh, if we had a clear objectives winning community control over police, if we had clear objectives winning community control over police, and we wanted to build an entire movement around advancing this objective, then the question would be, how do we do that? What do we need to build in order to win community control of police for, uh, uh, certainly for black communities? I think it would look like a few things, just in terms of what the ask would be and how that would move, is we would demand a, uh, 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 
have in any community, and the communities have to figure out how to split this up. But we'd have to demand that a vote to, to where each uh, city, for example, will be split up in different parts. I don't know how every city will be split. I do have a sense of how Miami, for example, will be split. Miami has five, the city of Miami has five commission districts. I was split up in somewhere between six and seven uh, policing districts. And those policing districts will be smaller than the commission districts, and sometimes they would overlap significantly. Uh, but then each of those districts would then get a chance to vote if they want to keep their police department. So we'd have a, essentially a one question ballot. Uh, and every district will get the vote, just like you vote for your commissioner. You said, do you want this commissioner, or do you want that one, or this alder person, or that one? Uh, so you have a one-question ballot. Do you want to keep your police force or not? And if you like your police force, if you think they're doing great, if you think they're meeting your needs, and you think they are doing what you need them to do, then great, you vote to keep them, and you have the democratic right to keep them. If you say that the police force is not doing, or don't think the police force is doing those things for you, then you say no, and you vote the police force out. And the police force then is voted out, and as a, uh, uh, as a result of the vote out, that obviously leaves some level of vacuum, the, the existing police force, whether it's the city of Madison or the city of Miami or wherever it would be, uh, that it would be, uh, you could have two or three or more of those pockets then, uh, of those uh, policing districts would get entirely new police departments. So just so it's clear, in the colonial setting, there was no colony, there was no colony that said, uh, we want the end the colonial relationship with the French, and therefore we want to take over the French army, and we want to control the French army. There's no colony that said we want more of, uh, of uh, the colonized people to be included inside of the colonizing army, inside of the occupied army. The demand was always to end the occupation and to get the colonizing army out. So the demand here would not be to get more black people inside of the police department. The demand here would not be that we take over portions of the existing police department, which already has this pre-existing relationship with our community. The idea would be to get this police department out entirely and start an entirely new police department. Using the exact same budget funds. We're not great for us because more money is spent on police in our communities than any others. So we would keep that money, and all that money would continue to go in the exact same uh, police pot. Uh, so we'd still get all of those resources, they just would be used in the way that our community thought made sense, rather than the way that the white community thought made sense for us. Uh, so we'd have this vote, and then communities can vote, vote out the police, and if you vote out the police, then you get your new police department, uh, which was then run by the community. We would propose that for, for the, by the way, uh, organizations that engage in um, electoral politics, I don't, uh, haven't done much electoral politics work uh, myself, uh, but this is one where I think I would get involved in electoral politics. Yes. If we were to go, we have an issue all around the country with uh, black voter registration and black voter turnout, complaints that black people don't turn out. But if we were to go in black communities and say, you can vote out the police, black voter turnout would be like 160%. People <laughs> would vote like for breakfast, and then go to lunch, and then vote after that. So it would be, we'd have record high registration rates, we'd have record high uh, uh, turnout rates. Uh, so I think this would be a way of kick-starting democracy inside of uh, uh, certain communities. And if other communities, again, want to keep their police, let them do that. That's great, great for them. Uh, but in any event, so we, if we win that, then in certain communities, that you could, you, they would get their own police department. They could, of course, take advantage of economies of scale and hook up with other police departments and have one, like if you had two or three districts, even if they were not contiguous, would then say we want the same new police department uh, and share that space. So we'd have those, those, uh, uh, those uh, police departments set, uh, and then how would they be governed? What we're proposing then is uh, a community um, a civilian police control board. And the civilian police control board then would handle all aspects, would manage all aspects of the uh, police department. It would set the three important uh, parts, set the priorities for the police department, and priorities even inside of a department can change from district to district. So the priorities of a police department downtown uh, dealing with homeless population, et cetera, is often different than the priorities of police departments uh, on the suburbs of the city. Uh, but it, the, the board then would be in charge of uh, setting police priorities, uh, setting police policies, for example, the use of force policies or how much training they get, or what kind of training they get, et cetera. And also the third one would be practices. And practices then would mean the ability to hire and fire police. Uh, so we'd have then this board would have complete and total control over every aspect of the police department, hiring, firing a chief, hiring, firing individual cops who violate the rules uh, or otherwise making the, the, the rules. And again, the most important thing is setting the priorities for the police uh, uh, there, determining how, you know, anyway, so the, the priority. So 
with, uh, uh, with that syringe of, of, uh, of things covered, then we'd have to seat the board. We proposed then that the board would be entirely randomly selected from people who live inside of the district. So not businesses, not people who own property, uh, but people who live in the district. So if you live in the district, figuratively speaking, you put your name in a hat, uh, everyone over a certain age, whatever the age is, 18, uh, put your name in the hat, and then randomly 12 or so names are picked out of the hat, and those people sit on the board for a set period of time. You can even have a dual, like a by camera board, one that deals with everyday stuff like uh, the practices, so in other words, uh, hires and fires police, the other one was more towards setting policy and would sit for longer periods of time. So we could have those boards that would sit for short periods of time and for longer periods of time, uh, or it could just be one board that sits for whatever amount of time it is. But people are randomly selected, which means that every person in the community has an equal chance of getting a seat on the board. Uh, and it also means that we would, the, the board would not be selected by a process that favors um, uh, two kinds of people. One is people who are more uh, articulate than others and who can raise more money than others. So we have a bias now inside of the electoral system where those who do better TV interviews have a better chance of getting elected into office. So that's one bias which exists. And in the, particularly as it relates with the police board, uh, that is not the person who need, we, need, we need to get up on the uh, police board. We need to get people who are directly impacted by the way their tax dollars are used uh, to the police department. Uh, and that should have nothing to do with your ability to raise money or your ability to speak in front of a TV camera. It should have to do with your uh, status as a human being and as a person living inside of the police district. Uh, uh, so the other thing it would prevent that is that people who could easily change their political position based on who's giving them money. If we were to open this up to a regular electoral process, it wouldn't be very long before the corrupting influences of all the other elections in this uh, country would then go and dominate these little local uh, uh, elections. And you'd have your next school, your, not school, your next uh, police uh, control board then brought to you by Walmart or brought to you by the good people at you know, whatever corporation, uh, like by the Koch brothers or by you know, Scott Walker's PAC. Uh, so this would avoid that. The only way then that the um, uh, that outside forces or even the police department could adversely influence the people who are going to be sat on the board, which is completely random. So in other words, a pe person the police pull over today could be sitting on the board tomorrow because it's completely and totally random. Uh, the only way they could avoid that is by uh, being nice to every single person that they have contact with and effectively bribing them, saying, we're, see, we're good, we can, we can not do anything to us because we're, uh, we're and that is a kind of, uh, of, of, of a bribery that takes place, and we would gladly take that. Um, uh, so it would be a, 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 what we propose then is a board that is entirely randomly selected uh, and randomly seated uh, uh, in order to uh, to run this. Uh, so that what would the so that's what we then push as a campaign. We said we want to have an electoral process that would then uh, put this uh, allow us to choose our own police department and then put this all civilian board into place. And this civilian board then can make all of the rules for the thing. And everybody in the community gets an equal chance to sit uh, a seat on that board. Right? So that would be the way that we would present, and then we'd have to build campaigns around that. There would obviously be all kinds of resistance to even allowing the democratic process of the allowing us to have informed consent and self-determination, even engaging in the democratic process of having a vote on this. But having a vote on the people who get to carry guns in our community and shoot us and arrest us and uh, deprive us of, of our liberties. Uh, so we would have to engage in a struggle just to get that. So how do we win that struggle? How do we get over those parts and as they throw legal obstacles in front of us as well as other kinds of obstacles? So that's what we'd have to actually build a movement around. I don't think we have to build a movement around winning the election. I think we could win the election. The movement would have to fundamentally be built around getting the election in the first place and making sure they're not putting all kinds of legal roadblocks in front of us. So how would we build that? So we have a movement model that we developed when we were uh, doing uh, Take Back the Land, which we think would, the model itself would work just as effectively here uh, in this scenario. So we use as a metaphor for building, um, uh, for movement building, for a movement, a sphere. Uh, uh, and we thought the metaphor worked for a number of ways, and we'll see as we identify the different parts. But we think that a sphere here would work as a metaphor movement. So we then build a movement and model it out of the parts of the sphere. So the tip of the sphere then is what we're calling positive action, what most people call civil disobedience or direct action. Uh, you know, we don't want to do the words to right now, but uh, this is the taking to the street. This is taking over 
places. This is blocking traffic. This is stopping Christmas stuff. This, the point of, the, of, of this action uh, is for our rising up, our movement to, uh, to represent such a drain on the resources of the system that they have to give in to our demands. Uh, this is what won the Civil Rights Movement. It wasn't the ability of, the, of Martin Luther King to convince white people to love the black people they've been hating all these years. It was the ability of the sit-ins to cost the businesses that were being sat in on so much money that they had no choice but to say, we want to end segregation. Not because we <coughs> think that uh, the races should be equal. They weren't ending, they were not ending racial prejudice. They were not saying we're no longer going to have racial animosity towards black. They're saying we're going to end the laws of segregation that said black people were not allowed to eat here. So the uh, passive action campaigns and direct action campaigns have the capacity to do this. Uh, the other thing that it does in terms of, of movement building is it opens up political space in a way that other things cannot, just the mere existence of ideas. So we could say as the existence of ideas back in the 1950s and 60s, black people shouldn't be discriminated against. We can say today black people shouldn't be shot uh, by the police when we're unarmed. Uh, but our ability to win that argument is not based on anything. We can't win that argument just as an argument. In fact, as I say that uh, it is uh, impossible to convince someone of something when they're getting paid not to be convinced of that thing. Right? So if there's someone who's financially benefiting from the way, from the existing order of things, there's no way we're going through discussion, through argument, through logic or reason, going to be able to convince them that we're right. Because that's not what they're basing their decisions on. They're basing their decisions on what they can make money off of. And right now, there's people who are making all kinds of money off of the prison industrial complex, so it's going to be really difficult to convince them that they should change their ways because they're making a lot of money off of that way, and they won't make money off of it. So we then engage in these actions. These actions would take over, and they, but they would have to be directed towards a particular target. A spear only does you good when you are pointing at a target. If you, if you block, uh, blindfold yourself, spin around three times, and then throw a spear, you're probably not going to get the kind of utility out of it uh, that was intended. It only is uh, useful when you know exactly where you're pointing it uh, towards. Uh, in the spear, the tip of the spear, then the job of the tip of the spear, of course, is to penetrate the target. And what, you know, when using the spear, what kills the animal is not the tip of the spear, because the tip of the spear is too small for that. So if the whole spear was just that thin, it probably wouldn't be able to do that. What kills the animal are the hooks at the end. <coughs> but the hooks at the end can't get in by themselves. With the blunt top, it can only get in with the tip of the spear. So the tip of the spear creates this political space. So the political space it creates then, we engage these actions, and as a result of the actions, the system comes back and says, okay, all right, you win, what's your demand, what do you want? And we have to be able to answer that, I think, in two uh, fundamental ways. The first one is in terms of public policy. What public policy uh, proposals, what public policy demands are we going to put forth that will do one of a few things, either result in, in significantly better governance, as we've talked about, uh, uh, briefly with uh, uh, making the requirement that police report on all the people who they kill. Uh, but I think that would be a relatively small part of it. I think the big things uh, on the policy plan have to be those policy uh, demands that reduce suffering or shift power. So we'd have to have policies that reduce suffering or shift power. So reducing suffering would include uh, ending the war on drugs when people are getting arrested for all kinds of minor offenses. Uh, it would include ending solitary confinement. Even if you are a prison abolitionist and don't believe in prisons, you can still get behind the idea of until we win that fight of, of winning prison, we have to end solitary confinement, which is in most places in the world regarded as torture. Uh, either regarded as torture and banned, or it's regarded as torture, that's exactly why they use it. Uh, so we have to have a series of public policy proposals that would make some shifts in the law in the United States, which wouldn't solve the problem fundamentally, but would significantly alleviate suffering when you do some of those things. Right? So that would and then uh, there are other policy uh, proposals that we can make that would actually shift power away from those who have it now and onto those who don't have it and who need to have it. So then the second way that so we we're able to get a series of uh, uh, engaging in positive action campaigns and we win and the state says, okay, what do you want? And we're able to develop a series of really good and clear public policy objectives. And by the way, this would be a public policy that self-determination elections to decide what the police do and don't do would also be under public policy in, in some ways. But I think more significantly would be on the other side, which we're calling third way or alternate structures, alternative structures of power. So in the third way or alternative structures of power, uh, it's not privately owned, it's not government owned or government controlled, but it is actually owned by 
uh, and controlled by communities. So here would be different ways of dealing with it. So an example of the third way would be to say, if there is a certain classes of crimes that happen in our communities, like the kids skip school, or a child uh, looks at their cell phone inside of class and the teacher asks them not to, and it's clearly against the rules, how do we deal with that? Right now, the public policy says the police comes in and slams the child on the ground or drag them out of the class. We would say that we have another way of dealing with this, and that is to take that problem of a child uh, uh, looking at their cell phone in class completely out of the hands of the state and allow the community to address that. How does the community address children who are in school looking at their cell phones? Uh, and then the community would have to look at it in a way that makes sense to the community and treat them with at least the level of compassion that are treated with white kids drinking beer and pointing their guns at police cars. Uh, so that this would take the, the, the solution then, and this is also another way of shifting power, entirely out of the hands of the government and place it directly into the hands of the community, who then would be responsible for uh, for meting out uh, uh, justice or, uh, or correct the behavior in the way that it saw fit. Uh, but the, it would take it then out of the criminal justice system and put it back in time, time and time. Right? So we then have to have a, a movement which would be able to represent and accomplish each one of these three areas. One without the other doesn't, simply would not work. And we do have each of these elements right now inside of the room. And then the, the fourth element uh, is facilitation and, and collaboration, uh, which is facilitation and collaboration among these three. So we say that right now, in this society, in the social justice movement as we call it, uh, each of these elements exists. We have organizations engaged in direct action right now. We have organizations with really good and powerful public policy positions. And we have organizations in, who are uh, certainly not the formal organization, but informal organizations, certainly communities. You see this in the Rastafari community and several other communities who engage in uh, alternate structures of power and alternate structures of decision making and dealing with internally. And we have organizations that do a fantastic job of collaborating or facilitating discussion and among other group, uh, 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 groups or sectors of the movement, of what would be a movement, but they're not talking to each other. So what's the difference between having just a bunch of chairs flown around in a room versus a bunch of chairs who are neatly laid out, well positioned, and a you know, system that's working, and, and so you can watch PowerPoint videos or do whatever. Uh, it's a, a level of organization uh, and collaboration. Position. The difference between a bunch of a junk room and a, an auditorium is the same difference between these things being out there right now floating in space or getting funded separately and a social justice movement that is working holistically in order to achieve a particular objective. And if we had an organization that would be that would be directed toward, if we had a social movement that was directed towards achieving a particular objective that agreed on the objective and the demand, then we could turn this from a junk room into a sphere that does uh, accomplishes those objectives. That's and the final part, of course, that we're doing these things, but none of that could be done without the push that's coming from mass organizations underneath. All right, mass organizations, of course, in the sphere uh, is where you get the force, is through the, uh, 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 through, the, through the pole of the stick, and that's how you are able to apply force, uh, even aside from the, from, the, uh, from the tip of the sphere there. And that can only happen through mass organization. So these are the parts of, the, uh, these are the parts of a social justice movement that we would have to build uh, and we don't even have to build them entirely from scratch because they all exist now. We would have to forge them. All the elements are already there. We would have to forge them into a movement that is all going in the same direction. Right now we have these pieces and they're just floating around or they're laying around as junk. If we could forge them uh, in a particular way, and I think the way is through ideological clarity and getting clarity on analysis, uh, objectives, and demands, then we could suddenly have them facing in the same direction and turn into a sphere rather than just uh, floating around. Uh, so this is what we think that the movement model would be. This is what our task uh, uh, would be uh, after we are clear on what the objectives and demands are. This would be that the kind of the technical way, and there are of course models that exist inside of each one of these, but this would then be the technical way in which we would achieve the objectives that we have laid out uh, uh, and, and, and uh, achieve the vision that is inside of the objectives and the, uh, and the demands. Uh, but, but in order to get to this, we have to develop clarity around both the analysis and the objective. So again, we're in a historic moment. We have a significant opportunity right now to move the ball in terms of democracy, in terms of suffering, uh, and in terms ultimately of liberation movements happening both inside of this country and outside. But it can only happen in, one, in, a, uh, in a real way 
with one deciding factor, and that is through organization. Everyone who is interested in advancing the cause of justice, in ending the disgraceful scenes like we saw yesterday uh, with the young girl in class, uh, must participate in the movement to end those injustices. And the only way we can meaningfully participate in, those, in the movement to end those injustices is by being in an organization that is actively engaged in the fight to end those injustices. Uh, no people have ever gotten up, oppressed people have ever gotten up, tripped and fell down into freedom. No oppressors have ever gotten up and accidentally made a motion, accidentally seconded the motion, and accidentally passed the motion to free the people that they were oppressing. Uh, the end of oppression only happens through organized activity, through uh, an organized work directed in a particular, uh, uh, with particular, with specific objectives uh, and demands, uh, uh, and people organize around a strategy to get to those demands. Uh, and of course, winning beyond a narrow scope only happens through social movements, uh, mass, mass social movements, and that can only happen with robust cooperation among different sectors of the We have an opportunity to advance and achieve this here. We miss significant chances. We miss significant opportunities through the foreclosure crisis. We miss significant opportunities where people were getting up, large numbers of white people in particular through Occupy Wall Street. We cannot afford to continue to miss opportunities, certainly around the time uh, 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 the move to Black Lives. Um, okay. And as other, we could then use this exact same system that we put in place today as the next set of crises come up uh, and we have additional opportunities to transform the society. We must build organization today, we must build a movement today that can transform the society forever. Thank you. So if you could just raise your hands and Max can call on you. Right, questions, comments? And try to speak up so that everybody hears you. We have good acoustics, but do speak up. Where can, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Where did non-whites who are also not black fit in your model? One question. And another is, when you started talking about the police force being very different, So uh, uh, we live in a pluralistic society. Uh, so it's going to be um, uh, uh, it will be difficult to have a mass movement that did not include uh, a broad range of that plurality. Uh, it would have been difficult for the civil rights movement to move the way that it did without the participation of whites and non-black, uh, non-whites, uh, uh, other people of color. Uh, just a short. Uh, and it will be difficult for this movement to move if we don't have the participation of both as well. Uh, however, with that said, I think we have uh, uh, most uh, communities uh, have unique and particular problems and have to then organize internally in order to address those unique and particular problems. And even inside those communities, however, uh, uh, we have class divisions that don't allow the communities to act uh, singularly. Uh, and then we have to have organization inside of those communities based on class strata as well. So we'll take back the land when we had it in Miami at least. Uh, we, uh, it was explicitly a black organization. We had uh, white supporters and people of color supporters uh, as well. Uh, but we, uh, we also had supporters, and then we didn't want in decision making spaces, uh, non-black people in those decision making spaces. So we had, it was effectively an all black organization uh, in Miami. It did not continue that way as it expanded beyond. Uh, it was an all black organization, but it was not an all black meaning every single black person, it was an all black working class. We did not have black lawyers in our group. We didn't have black middle class or aspiring black middle class or people who wanted to be elected officials in our group either. It was a black working class organization. We felt like we had uh, 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 different class orientations than uh, some of the other. So as a result, the black middle class, as we, as we probably uh, call it, even though it may not, that's a misnomer in many ways, uh, uh, the black middle class, we put them more of in a category as uh, people of color supporters than we did as members of uh, Take Back Black. Uh, and I think we have the same, uh, similar kind of, of uh, connections uh, uh, here. There are organizations that are explicitly um, uh, one race, 
and then they have alliances with other races or with other uh, classes, and there are multiracial organizations. Uh, I think we have to uh, uh, be realistic uh, about the about two things, uh, uh, two sides. One is the ability of a black movement to take off, particularly in cities like Madison, where the black population is so small. Uh, the ability, uh, what the range of things that we can accomplish in that area. But the second thing we have to be realistic about is the unique situation faced by black people in the United States. And because of that unique situation, we have to have unique organizing tools uh, and areas for them. So uh, I think every community should organize inside of itself, both uh, 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 along class, uh, also potentially along race lines, if any, it doesn't happen with every community, but, um, uh, uh, but in those communities that where it makes sense and that should uh, happen. Uh, and then we have to figure out how we're going to partner with each other where we agree on issues, uh, objectives, and strategies, and uh, demands and tactics. What else? Welfare services provided? Yeah. Be part of the police? You said policing would change dramatically. Yes. So do you mean that it would really also include mental health kinds of things? Yeah, so I think that uh, I, I, it wouldn't be that we would have the police become suddenly responsible for mental health uh, care. Uh, but we would certainly have the police, and again, at this point, we probably wouldn't call them police. But we have the police responsible for making sure that people who, who were having in, uh, mental health crises, and even before they got to mental health crises, then be responsible for making sure that they get to somewhere where they can get treatment. Uh, rather than seeing that person as a threat to everyone else, uh, who they have to protect everyone else from that one person, and therefore, uh, if someone calls and says the person's having a mental health breakdown, then the police's reaction is to behave aggressively towards that person in order to, I think the main task would be to keep that person safe. Uh, and I don't think that's the main task right now, certainly not inside of the uh, uh, So I think that it would be their job to generally keep the people safe, whether it's a mental health issue or not, but certainly in terms of mental health issues, I think there would, there would be, uh, it would get it would be so drastically transformed, it's difficult to talk about, think about the police that engaging in that behavior, uh, but it would, it would basically, we, we would have a force uh, who would have the capacity to uh, provide support for people who are uh, experiencing um, uh, who are experiencing crisis and all kinds of crises, drug related, mental health related, etc. Probably. Um, yeah. So, uh, how well is this advancing across the country? I mean, are, where are the places where it's particularly being taken on as a core, you know, orientation and strategy? So the, uh, the proposal is still very new. And so there's a number of cities that have, three cities actually, that have made the call. So Madison, uh, Rochester, New York, and Chicago have made the call for community control of the police. There's nowhere where the campaign has moved to the point where uh, we had any real discussions about it being on the ballot or anything like that. Uh, and I think that's still going to take a couple of years to happen. Uh, right now, we are engaged, I think, in, in uh, sequentially we have two processes that we're engaged in. The first, which we're doing now, is meeting with and having discussions with people engaged in movements, social movements, uh, to say this is what our demand should be, this is what our analysis should be, and this is also what our objective should be, and this is what the demand should be for this time. And this should be the fundamental demand for this time. Uh, and then to win people who are already engaged in some kind of action to the idea that this should be the demand. Right now, we don't have unity around this idea. Most people, I don't think, know about the idea. Having considered it, I think one of the reasons people haven't considered it is I don't think we have a good concept in the United States of what power is. Uh, and so even when people are making demands, I think we have difficult wrapping our, difficulty wrapping our brains around what it means to contend for power, which is what I think we should be, uh, we should be doing. Uh, so getting the, uh, the idea that we should be contending for power, and that this is the way in which we should contend for power inside of the sector, inside of the public sector. Uh, so getting to, to, to that, I think, is where we are now in terms of sequential. Uh, once we get a 
significant number of people who you, you think can, uh, are ready to make the call for it, then it'll be a matter of having more of an air war to get that same message out to the general public. Uh, and then once the message out to the general public and people are thinking about it uh, uh, and talking about it, then I think it would be the third part of the sequence would be to try to, in one city or more than one city, launch the campaign. I think we'd want to launch a campaign in a very small number of cities to begin with uh, so that we can focus maximum amount of or, uh, movement resources in those places so we can do three or four campaigns really, really well rather than 100 campaigns really uh, poorly. Uh, and then once those campaigns go well, then we think it will be pick up uh, exactly that. I think once we get a few campaigns going, it will be exceedingly difficult for organizations to come and argue that their communities deserve something less than full democratic control of the police. If we're able to even launch it somewhere and lose it, it'll be difficult for the next city to come up after police shooting and say, what we need here is more training for the police. I think once people in the general public, but certainly people in black communities say, realize that one of our options is having control, is having power over, and why would we then settle for something like police cameras, body cameras, or settle for, uh, uh, for something that doesn't shift power? Uh, I think once the idea of shifting power uh, so that it's set in our communities emerges and is seen as something that is viable and real, it'll be very difficult to go back to something else. I think the attempts would be made at that. Uh, and we've already seen some where people have, have used the term community control, but then when they described what it was, it really is a civilian oversight board, which we are not saying it should be right. We're, uh, not that we think there's no use to them, that doesn't contend for power. We think we should be fighting for power. Um, so we've seen that, I think that's going to happen continuously. But it's going to be an attempt to shift the definition over. Uh, uh, so I think those are going to be some of the things that will happen. And I think people are going to say, uh, well, we can't trust you know, people to uh, do the police, you know, to tell the police what to do. There could be all kinds of attempts to undermine the idea that people have the right to democratically decide what happens themselves. So, yes? Right here. Back, sorry. Right here. Back. Oh, here, okay, I'm sorry. Take two. Um, okay, so my question is about tactics. Um, so it's you about mentioned tactics. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned um, like the wonderful protests that have been happening all over the country, uh, and most of it has been involved like blocking traffic. There's been like a major like tactic that people have used. And I just want to know: one, do you think that this is effective, uh, or that it has been effective? Two, do you think that it'll, if so, do you think it will continue to be effective? And if not, how do you think? Um, tactics should change, um, especially uh, in smaller cities where um, it would be, I think it would be harder to, or maybe, so I think in some cities it would be harder to overwhelm your police force um, with just stuff, right, with actions. Um, so do you think um, the current actions that are very in your face, uh, like, for example, watching me, we have a hard time even getting a, a news uh, reporter to come out now, you know? And so I'm just wondering what you think um, about the tactics that people are using and will they continue to be effective? So are the tactics that people are using effective in terms of blocking the streets, et cetera, right? Yes. So, um, so tactics and strategies, tactics are very specific ways, strategies are general ways of uh, achieving an objective, right? That's all it is. Uh, so if I were to say I went, I don't know what the main highway is, is I, if I were to say I went to the highway and I went east on the highway, was that an effective tactic? Well, it depends, where were you going? Like if you were going uh, uh, one place, then that may be the most effective tactic you could take. If you were going another, like, okay, if I said I, I went on the highway and I went north, was that the effective tactic? Well, if you were trying to go to Canada, then probably it was an effective tactic. If you're trying, however, to go to Texas, it probably was not a very effective tactic to go north on the highway. Um, uh, so it, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. I think absent of getting a clear idea of what we are trying to accomplish, it is impossible to evaluate the effectiveness of these actions. It's just impossible because we don't know if we're going. So if your objective was to, uh, to get dinner, and that was the worst tactic. Why'd you block the street to get dinner? That didn't make any sense. You should go to a place at home or to a grocery store or wherever to get dinner. Uh, if you're, uh, so I think we can only evaluate tactics and strategies as they relate to objectives. And because we're not clear yet on objectives and commands, then we can't really evaluate in any substantial way 
the effectiveness of the tactics and strategies that we've been using. With that said, tactics and strategies have been incredibly brave. Uh, and they have demonstrated that people are willing to do things in order to uh, uh, oppose what they uh, are against. Uh, and presumably that means then, if we had something that, that we're for and it was within our grasp, that it would be, that, that we would at least now have the ability to get there. We, people would be willing to do what they had to do in order to get there. Uh, so I think that's what it means. So for me, that it, it has, it's, it's incredibly inspiring knowing that once we lay out a vision, if we're saying, all right, you were willing to block the street for two hours and you weren't gonna win anything out of it. All you were gonna do was register to the general public that you were unhappy about this. Would you be willing to block the street for six hours if you knew at the end of it you'd have power over the police? And I think people would say yes. If I was willing to do that for getting attention from the media, I'm certainly willing to do this in order to, uh, uh, in order to win something tangible, in order to win power. Uh, so I think it, it uh, uh, I don't know whether or not it's been effective. I do think it is a potentially effective organizing tool. Uh, so if the goal was to get more people involved in the movement, I think it's done that. Because it has excited people, it has, it has inspired people. Uh, but I don't know if that was the goal or not. Uh, but if the goal was to, if the goal was to end police brutality, it was not an effective way to do it. gentrification there. So this is at a time when the housing prices were still zooming up, if we all remember that. The housing prices were zooming up, and in Miami in particular, they were doubling like on a regular basis, like every couple of years, uh, sometimes even more quickly than that. So the housing prices were going way up, and that meant that long-time black communities were being forced out of their neighborhoods. So we started the organization as a way of engaging in what we call land struggle. So we have said that the core issue uh, is land, not housing. And housing is just a derivative of land. The big problem was land and land relationships. And that's what we have to actually fix and solve. So the first thing we did with as Take Back the Land as an organization, first of all, even before we came out, we had, in, in secret, we had three to four months of just meetings, of just hashing out what our theory was, what our analysis was, and what our objectives ultimately would be. Uh, and then at the end of that, we emerged and we did our first action where we seized control over a vacant lot in the Liberty City section of Miami, and we house otherwise homeless people by building Shantytown uh, there. And the Shantytown stood for six months. Uh, after the Shantytown fell to a fire that we believe was set by the city of Miami, that's uh, when, the, um, uh, when the foreclosure crisis started. And we noticed that there were these empty houses dotting our communities. And we started then the second phase of Take Back the Land, which was identifying vacant government-owned and foreclosed homes. We would break into them and then move homeless people into peopleless homes. Uh, and then we would launch eviction defenses when the police came and we would block them. And we did that a total, I think it was 18, uh, liber what we call land liberations. We didn't call it occupying it, we called it liberating the land uh, there in, in Miami. Now, we did that in Miami and then uh, as it got attention, we then started working with organizations in other cities, most prominently here, in, one of the most prominent ones was here in Madison, where there was a Take Back the Land Madison uh, organization, and we worked then to, to build it out. So as we're doing that, we're trying to, to see, even if we could win certain things in Miami, how do we win uh, much bigger uh, things throughout the society? And we knew that we had to build not just an organization to do that, uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is just because of the size and scope of, of, the, uh, of the country and the economy and the problem. 
But the other was that we were a particular type of organization where we only did a small set of things. All we wanted to do was break into houses and do eviction defenses. Like, that's it. No one else wanted to do anything else. We didn't want to be landlords. So even if we won, we wouldn't have accepted the homes ourselves. So just all kinds of uh, things there. Um, uh, so we had to build a movement, a holistic movement. So we actually looked at and studied movement models and, and how movements were built in different countries and we, in different societies, or this society in different times. And we recognized some of these elements and we tried to put them in play as, as we went. So we did develop this model both as a result of study, but also as a result of practice of seeing what we needed in order to get things moving in this, uh, uh, in order to build a movement to elevate housing to the level of the human right. Uh, we also tried to make it a model as we're building a movement model, we try to make it a model that was more universally applicable than one just for take back the land. So we're trying to build one that would then be useful and replicable during the next crisis, <laughs> during the next movement building moment. Uh, and so we think we did that, and we think we did that pretty effectively. So that is a movement model, not just one for take back the land. So we think we're going to have a number of barriers to even getting to a uh, vote, even though uh, uh, we think that, that there's nothing more democratic than voting on the people who you're paying, not just the people patrolling your community with guns and et cetera, but the people who you're paying to do that. Like, you think we should have some control over that. And I think, by and large, many white communities think that they do have control over it. Uh, but very few black communities think that we do. Very few black communities feel an affinity towards the police department or feel like the police department is there to help them. Even if there are times we feel like we need them in order to solve this particular problem that we can't solve ourselves, very few people in the black community, certainly very few black communities as a whole, feel like uh, the police are there to help us or are there because we want them there. Uh, uh, so uh, we think that this would be a integral part of the democratic process, which is to say that people who are there supposedly to serve and protect would then have the blessing of those who are serving and protecting and the instruction of those who are serving and they're not serving you if they're doing something that you don't want them to do. Uh, so, how, so, so we think that just in terms of democratic theory, this should be something very easy to get. To say, well, we want to regularly vote out. We get to regularly vote out elected officials. We should get to regularly vote out the police department as well. Uh, but right now, that doesn't happen. So we think that this should happen through democratic theory. We think this is extremely democratic. Uh, yet, we think that there's a number of entrenched interests that are going to try to prevent this from happening. Uh, and those insurance interests are going to be those who benefit from the colonial relationship or who see the colonial relationship as integral to their own survival. For whites who are afraid of black communities, they're not going to want us to vote on our own police department uh, because they want to have a police department that they can sit on black communities uh, and on individual blacks who can coach into, uh, into white communities. So, uh, so we think there's going to be a number of potential stops. I think the, the big one which will be the, the course of greatest debate is going to be people saying, well, people in those communities are not qualified to decide what happens uh, with the police do. Um, uh, which again, we would then like to we would just say more honestly that some people deserve democratic representation and some people don't. And then that would allow the freedom of hearing that would then allow us to, uh, as a community, make decisions about what our relationship is in society. Uh, I think there's also going to be roadblocks around the legality of it. Well, is this legal? Is that legal? Um, uh, are you able to create a separate police force? Doesn't have to be actually run by the city council, things like that. Uh, but I think all of those things would be at an easily, we could work easily around those things uh, if there was another community that was demanding it or some version of it. Uh, so we do have a couple of examples. We're not ready to talk about them uh, from them, but there are a few examples of where police have allowed local communities to garner significant control over certain classes of, of law. I think the, the place where it breaks down is over certain classes, like murder and stuff like that. But certain class of law, there are several communities that have control over the way they handle those things. Both in terms of overt, um, uh, overt agreements. In other words, police and communities have an agreement that if something happens, this set of things happens in your community, then you handle it yourself, and we'll handle everything above that. Uh, but also in terms of not of not overt things, uh, uh, as I talked about with the uh, with the kids who put themselves on YouTube, 
There's no law. They, what they did was against the law. And yet they were not arrested. They were clearly on tape drinking. They were allowed to shoot outlets into drinking and, and carrying, open carrying, uh, and pointing a gun at the police car is actually against the law. A loaded gun at the police car is against the law. While drinking, it's probably against the law. Yeah. Uh, so there are, they could have arrested them for that, but they did not. Um, so there are informal, uh, uh, there are ways of getting around that. And the reality is, you know, uh, uh, laws are not the reason. People don't follow laws all the time, so they can create. Uh, if they wanted to get something done, they can get something done. Uh, so I think there's going to be all kinds of legal uh, barriers going on way as well uh, uh, to get that. If we get, and then we've knocked out all the legal barriers to us having our own police departments, there would then be all kinds of barriers to us being able to take the vote itself. So, we allow the vote to happen, et cetera. Um, uh, with the format of the vote, it doesn't have to be a change in the, uh, in the, in the charter, in the state charter, or the county charter, the city charter, where exactly the change has to be, and well, you did this, but you didn't do that. So I think all those things are going to come up, and they'll probably come up in order. Uh, but I think the big thing is this will be a mass effort to convince people uh, that Certain communities shouldn't have the right to control the police departments there because they will turn them into criminal police departments. Uh, of course, there are criminal police departments all around the United States. But we don't talk about it that way because they're, they're protecting the criminals that they want to protect. Um, I do think there are there are going to be places where, where, where we will be able to win in spite of those roadblocks. And when we do, we're going to face an entirely new set of challenges. So imagine, let's say we let's say we launch a fantastic campaign. We engage in direct action, and we cost the system so much money, they're like, okay, we give up, you can have the vote. And we have the vote, and the black community comes out, and we vote to end the police department that exists and put in our own police department. What happens next? Is the police department going to come and give us all the guns? Like, what is the next thing that's going to do? Are they going to willingly do that? Uh, so I think, uh, uh, I think it's unlikely they would do that completely. So I think we're, in all likelihood, had an announcement saying, look, we know we've been, some version of it would say this way, but it would effectively be, we know we've been talked for many generations now about how this is a democracy, but this is not actually a democracy. You're not going to vote on your police department, and we're not going anywhere. We're not giving you the guns. Your vote doesn't actually mean anything. Your vote was there, it was legal, but you are not getting what you voted. In which case, again, we'd have to make some decisions about what our relationship is. Uh, on the other hand, they give up, they hand in their guns, and they hand over the budget, and great, we'll be happy with that. But I think there are going to be a lot of robots that are going to put up all the way to the very end, even if we win the election for the initial Okay, we have this two. Mm -hmm. That was actually kind of leads into my question, which was, um, what was your vision of this new police department? Because if police, I don't know a lot about police academies, but if we go with the notion that the police are currently an occupied force, that, that training is not the problem. So we get, we want the new, where are these new police gonna come from and is there, you know, like I'm thinking of like restorative justice programs right. and different approaches to how to, to deal with crime and you know, other problems in the community. Yeah. So I guess that was the next sort of big one of then what? What is their new vision of what this new police department looks like? So I think a couple things will kick in right away. Um, First of all, people who, I think one of the rules would have to be that if you're going to serve the police department, you have to live in the community that you're serving. And that way you don't have outside forces who are coming in and see as, as a place they come in, they clock in, they do their war zone, and then they clock out. Uh, so I think that would be one, uh, one thing that would be pretty significant. Uh, but I think the other one is, um, uh, I don't think we'd have to go on some big search for some entirely new way of doing things. Uh, I think right now, again, because, uh, uh, I would say that white communities as a whole, certainly not poor, uh, poor white communities, but middle class and uh, uh, wealthy white communities, have control over their police. The police don't think that they can get away with certain things against the people who they feel like are in power, the group who they collectively feel are in power, regardless of who the police chief is. They don't feel like they have the political space to do that, even if they want to do that, which they don't always want to do that because they see those people who they're working with as human beings. Um, so I think then all we have to do is find human beings who feel the same way that those police feel about their neighborhoods to feel about our neighborhoods. That one, the people who live there are in power and they would have to feel their wrath if they behave a particular way around them. And, uh, and the second is that they feel a level of human uh, uh, 
uh, human identification with the people who they are policing to or for or with or however you want to uh, call it. Uh, so I think even beyond, even before we go into the whole thing of how we transform things, I think if we just have human beings who enter the police force who believe that the communities they're working in have power and have humanity, then that would automatically mean that we would get some treatment just like the white communities have. I think if we had that, a lot of people would be happy. Anecdotally, my partner is a public defender in Washington, D.C. Uh, and just started, uh, just finished a year, year there. And, uh, uh, and so when they start your first year, you're in the juvenile section, so you deal with, with, uh, with people who are under 18. And she was there for a few months and going to court every day, and you know, even if she wasn't trying cases, she was there in court looking around. And at some point, she said, there are no white people as defendants, in court. like all, 100% of the white people are attorneys who are there, or clerks or otherwise working there. There are no white defendants in DC. And DC is 50% um, uh, black uh, and about 30, 40% uh, white, maybe a little bit more. Um, uh, and declining rapidly on the 50%. Uh, and so you'd figure that it would be roughly that breakdown, but it looks like it is 90% black, 10% everything else, and zero white. So she was like, and it became a joke in the office of like, oh, there's no white people here. And then she comes home one day from work and she says, you're not gonna believe this, there was a white defendant today. <laughs> yeah, this was like, uh, I think it was last January or something like that. So anecdotally, there was a white defendant in the month of, one white defendant in the month of January, like the first one in months in the month of January, right? So maybe there were others that she didn't see, but just anecdotally, anyhow, from someone who's in there every day, this is the one that, that did. And she asked them, so she tried to find out who it was, and blah, blah, found the lawyer to get the scoop behind how did a white person end up in the court system. So it turns out it was a white girl who lived in Upper Northwest, which is a wealthy neighborhood in DC, and she was caught skipping school, which is against the law in DC, and a lot of children are brought into school for that. So how, so she got arrested for, this is unbelievable, white girl got arrested for skipping school. Not really. White girl was picked up skipping school. The police brought her home to her mother and said, your daughter's skipping school, please get her back to school. And the mother said, oh no, this is the third time now that she skipped school, you've caught her skipping, she skipped school a bunch of times, this is the third time you've caught her and every time you bring her back here, I demand you arrest her. <laughs> And the police said, no, we don't want to arrest them. We're just bringing it back. You can take care of them. And she said, no, if you don't arrest them, I'm going to call your supervisor and report you. And instead of having the supervisor called and getting reprimanded, getting a, put in a permanent record that he refused to arrest someone on the orders of their mother, they arrested the girl. This is the only white person in white juvenile in DC court was there because their mother demanded the police on fear of retribution. It's the dictionary them. definition of the exception that proves the rule. Of, of what? The exception that proves the rule. Yeah, exception that proves the rule, exactly right. So yes, that's it. So totally shocking, right? That's the kind of police we want in our community. And I don't think they have to go through any particular kind of training for that. Uh, uh, but I think that's the way most white people want the police treating their children. Uh, and that's the way most black people want police treating their children. But we can't do that when the police are controlled by people outside of our community and are uh, seen as, as an occupying force. So someone else would need money. So I'm wondering, do you see that uh, sort of human decency kind of trickling into other communities once some communities opt to take control of their own police departments and other communities that are probably predominantly white say, no, this is working fine for us, we're going to keep our, our current community. And then, so my daughter was black, and she has to drive through these communities to get to work. She she wants to be able to drive in the whole city. How do you see that eventually changing? And I'm as pissed off at, a, at the, you know, across the board. It doesn't, like, the community distinction is not mattering to me emotionally. I'm curious of all of those comments. Right. So, um, in terms of humanity, I don't know if humanity is going to kind of trickle down or trickle across. Gush out. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's going to do that. Uh, the, uh, obviously, that would be great. But again, I think it exists now in, in many communities. It doesn't exist in our community. And this would just mean that it would exist in our community. Uh, and it would exist in our community because we would demand it. And, and we would then have a mechanism to which any uh, police officer who does not 
demonstrate the level of humanity that we require, we could kick off the force. We'd have the power to do that. And they wouldn't be rewarded by the white communities like, this is great, this is what we need to keep black people in check, because we need someone to, we would then be able to say, this is not the kind of stuff we want our community, you're out. Uh, so I think once that happened, then we would get, and it would either happen through humanity or through fear. And I'm emphasizing humanity here because I think that that's the, the thing to me that is, uh, uh, that we would aspire to. But the reality is, the cold, hard political reality is we actually don't need the humanity. We could just use the fear. Because if we have the power and they know that they'll get fired or worse, they'll get arrested if they behave in this way against us, then you know, it doesn't matter to me if, if they're doing it from uh, fear of power or from humanity. I prefer they do it from humanity. And I think if they're coming from inside of our community, we'll do it for humanity. But if they're not, or if they're from outside of our community and they're not doing it for the love of humanity, then I'm not going to stay up at night figuring out how to turn this person human. I'm going to go to be able to go to sleep at night knowing that my child is not going to get killed by the police because they're in fear of our power. Um, so I think that's where we that's where we have to go. In terms of the problem with the kind of like the patchwork of police departments which could end up happening and the ability to drive through, I think it could be extremely problematic for some time, frankly. Uh, I don't know. I actually don't know how how it'll how it'll happen, how it'll work. Uh, this is a looking long term down, but I think there's a potential for it to be extremely problematic. Um, and you know, I don't think it's entirely. I don't think this is a likely scenario, but I don't think it's entirely outside of the question that at some point we have, you know, retaliatory arrests happening. So a black kid got arrested going to the white neighborhood. So now the black uh, the black neighborhood has to arrest a bunch of white kids and then call the white police department and do a prisoner exchange. <laughs> and, uh, but that would put us in a, as bad as that would be, as disturbing that, that would actually put the black community in a better position then than, than we are now. We have, no, we have no capacity to exchange. We're the only ones getting arrested, and we have no ability to enforce an exchange. So I hopefully it wouldn't get to, to that point, uh, uh, but I think at least in the initial stages, we'd have a lot of people who are very unhappy about the arrangement because they feel like they lost power, so they lost the ability to punish us the way they, they wanted. And I think that would have some repercussions. I don't think those are repercussions that we understand yet. Certainly, I don't. that say this is our analysis and say that this is the analysis and based on this analysis this is then the objectives that we want to have for this movement moment and then based on these objectives these are the demands. I mean that to be really really explicit and to the extent that different organizations have if, if everyone had the exact same analysis there would only be one organization because that's what an organization is, is people with the same analysis the same objectives same demands using the same strategy joining up together in order to move something. Uh, so we would, we would have slightly different analysis possibly slightly different uh, objectives, uh, and of course slightly different demands, uh, but I think we'd have to fundamentally have to, have to unite around, as a movement, around the demands, even if we weren't totally united around the objectives and the, uh, and the analysis. So we'd have multiple organizations who would be close enough on the objectives, potentially close enough on the analysis. Uh, there may be some organizations, for example, who just believe in democracy, and who don't think that, that the black community is an occupying force, but does think that every community has the right to decide who carries guns in their uh, communities. So they would say, we don't agree on the analysis, we do agree on the objective, and we do agree on the demand. So that would be good enough. We would want to know that. Like, we don't want to be, uh, we don't think we can build a movement based on winking at each other and thinking we all agree on something. We think we'd have to have really, really explicit agreements on uh, understandings of where we stand. And that means organizations internally have to have that discussion, and then organization to organization, we have to have those discussions, uh, and have them openly and honestly. Uh, and of course, some of it would be to challenge them and say, we think you got this wrong, you should change it. But some of it would not be to try to convert the other organization. It would just be to get a clear understanding and say, based on what your analysis, objectives, and demands are, we can work together. But based on your analysis, objectives, and demands, we cannot work together. And I think we want to have that level of clarity just to figure out how we can shape this movement, not so much to convert people. But I do think we should, you know, so right now, at this phase, in terms of the sequencing, what we're trying to do is convert people uh, and convert organizations and say, consider this uh, 
And then once converted, we don't think that they're going to adapt at 100%. Uh, I think people have a, the big thing people have challenges with is, is having a board that's not elected. So I think we'd have like a, a big fight about that. I'm not sure that's enough to break it down, to break down a movement, but I think that's like, that's something that people have trouble with. I think people have trouble with the idea of uh, black communities as an occupying force, not as a metaphor, but as an actual thing. So I think we'd have to get those things clear. Uh, it's very possible that we could agree, uh, if this, we think of this as a six step program, we could agree on steps one, two, and three, but then we would diverge in multiple directions from four, five, and six. So we have to know that so that we're not thinking we're going in for a long ride with someone and then we get angry at each other at step four when we split up. We want to know that at step one and not be angry about it at step four. So we're working on time here, so we have, we have to get, uh, uh, as I said, we wouldn't have to go home at 9 o'clock, we'd have to be out of here. Yeah, we turn into a pump, the building turns into a pumpkin and we all turn into mice. So. All right. <laughs> all right, anything else? Okay. I think a lot of people just don't think they have power right now. Can you just speak up a little I think more? Most people don't think they have power right now. Many people don't think they have power right now. A significant amount of people think they don't have power right now to the point where when a lot of people just admit I don't vote. I, ha I hear that all the time. Um, so how, how is, what's the, what, may, what might be a good example of public policy that, that people can overwhelmingly get behind because it clearly shifts the power back to them, which they feel that they have lost already for whatever reason. Mm. So first of all, I, I agree with the analysis that people don't have power. Uh, I think even to the extent that we're able to vote, it's a very, um, uh, it becomes a bourgeois democracy means of expressing power, which is that you vote once every four years or once every two years, and then you almost have no impact on what the official then does. I, I think uh, most people find the officials that they elect don't do the things that they want them to do a significant number of times. Not all the time, a significant number of times. Uh, uh, and the way that power is structured in this country in both the macro and the micro, uh, it concentrates power. So uh, you have in the, uh, in the House of Representatives, whichever political party has 51% of the majority controls every committee, 100% of the committees and it turns out can determine whether or not a, a bill which is supported by the majority of the, by overwhelming majority of the, um, uh, of the Congress uh, as a whole, if it's not supported by a majority of the majority, then doesn't even, never even can make the floor. So uh, having 50.1% of the majority uh, in, in, in the national government equals having 100% of the power. And that disempowers a substantial number. So that everyone who voted for and won the Democrat, I'm not a, a party person at all, uh, but it will then effectively, at least in the way the Congress has, has, has operated the past few years, has lost their vote because they can't get things on the floor unless the majority of Republicans support it. This is a really, really uh, messed up situation to, to be in. That's on the, on the macro, on the, on the countrywide. Then on the, uh, on the local, then we're voting for people into, uh, uh, into office, but we're being presented with people to vote for by those who have all kinds of money to put them uh, up in the first place. Uh, so I think the idea, and those are the ones that ultimately have power because they can call up those elected officials and say, I need you to vote this way or that way, and they have to respond to them because they're the ones who put them in office in the first place. So I think the idea that we don't have a lot of power is right, which is also why we think that the, uh, uh, the notion of uh, randomly selected people sitting on the board does then empower not only entire communities who then have control over the, the, the police, but individuals inside the communities who then have a, a, this exact same opportunity as the well-spoken person or the person who can raise money to sit on the board where they can make decisions that have real and measurable impacts. They can make those, those decisions. So I think some of the things that we can do that would, um, uh, some of the policy um, uh, things that, that have real power results uh, around the foreclosure uh, crisis would have been to fight for, which is something to take back in the last fight, community control over land, which is a community, democratically controlled community land trusts, which then control plots of land that they can do what they want to with housing, they can do what they want to with business or with farm land, but can't sell the, the land. So in other words, it has to become permanently affordable and it's permanently under the, uh, uh, under the management of the community that has access to it, that uses it. 
that would then would empower small numbers of people to make real decisions about the land around them. So that Starbucks couldn't come in or a jewelry store couldn't come in and say, we think what your community needs is a jewelry store or a Starbucks here. A community can say, this is our pile of land. What, do we, what would we like to see here that we can make the decision about what we do here? Which is the exact opposite of what happens now, which is the big company comes in, bribes elected officials, and then puts whatever they want in the loop. We drive by and say, oh, there's a new store over there, regardless of what the needs of the neighborhood actually are. So I think that would change significantly by getting community control of the land. Uh, as it relates to the uh, police issues, again, we think democratic uh, uh, community control of the police would, uh, is the ultimate shift in power in this sector of the, uh, of the public sphere. Uh, there are probably some others that can do so in the small, smaller ways, uh, in particular, um, uh, some measures that would advance the idea of restorative justice where local communities then try to make whole, again, the parties that were involved in some kind of uh, confrontation, and that is taken then entirely out of the criminal justice system and is handled inside of communities. That would give them the communities the power to decide if someone is punished or rehabilitated and what justice actually looks like uh, for them. Uh, and it wouldn't then leave it to some cop to, to use their own discretion and use it very unevenly, by the way, uh, of what happens in this situation when white kids in school versus black kids in school. Yes? What role do you think a high school um, age person would play in this? So what role would a high school age person would play in I was here uh, a few months back when there was an incident at a high school here. What's the high school in the Which high school? When I was here, at the, at the, the action at the, at the high school? East. East high school? So there was an incredible, amazing, I thought very inspiring action that happened in school as a result of a competition that happened there. It was a uh, teacher in front of us. I don't remember exactly the particulars were. But the, the students then took to, basically had a walkout in class. Uh, uh, walkout in class. And completely freaked out the administration, completely West, freaked out the that police. Was hmm? That was West, sorry. That was West. Yeah. Completely freaked out the administration, completely freaked out. Um, uh, if you look at the civil rights movement, it, while it was started, traditionally the starting point is with the um, uh, was with the uh, with Martin Luther King and, and Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott. What really gave it the shot in the arm and then moved to the next level were the students from North Carolina A and T who then started sit-ins at the uh, Woolworths Five and Dime store, uh, Five and Dime restaurant over there. Uh, and we just have, just happened right before we started the conversation about how it's not the first one who starts something who actually starts a trend or a movement. It's the second one. So I think in that case also where the old civil rights head came in and did one thing, but then students came in and completely reimagined and reinvigorated it uh, and, and just recast. Uh, the movement in an entirely new way. I think that's what made the civil rights movement work, with the direct actions, with the sit-ins, et cetera. Uh, more so than the boycotts and the way that the, oh, and of course they had to quickly adapt uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference did. And then right on the heels of that, that SNCC, the uh, uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Movement. Students have moved social justice uh, in this country. Uh, both in the, uh, young workers did it in the, uh, during the uh, Great Depression, when we had the biggest shift in the uh, social safety net in the United States, and young people firmly were at the lead of the movement here in the United States during the civil rights movement. Uh, as well as, right now, during the movement for black lives. I think we've had it happen a lot more with college students, but I think the next wave that's gonna come will become entirely from college students and from even from high school students emerging. Uh, so I think that, that the biggest thing that young people can do is to unleash your imagination. Because when we, when you reach a certain time and age, you have seen things done a particular way for so long that that's the way that you end up, you develop these patterns or limits in your mind, even if you don't realize it. And when young people come and completely throw out the cast and reimagine the exact same principles in a new way, that is what re, uh, uh, reconstitutes a movement and gives it new life. And I think that's what. I'm waiting to see that happen. I think that will happen as soon as we're clear as a movement on what objectives are. I think we're going to see an entirely new wave of young people coming and reimagining the way of these actions. That's what I'd like. I'm dying to see that. And I think that's what we're going to start doing. That's what we're going to start doing. Yes? Um, I'm curious about the relationship between the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm sorry, we have a limited number of uh, M. Adams, who came in a bit late, uh, and I have been working on a, on a book, which we'll get out someday. But we do have excerpts from the book on 
black community control over police, so we have them here. We have a few copies of them if you want to take it. The excerpts are also available on our website, which is um, uh, positive.action.center. So Positive Action Center, positive.action.center, not .org, .center. You haven't seen that yet. But it's dot .center, so positive-action.center, and you can download it there, uh, but we also have some of the copies here if you want to get a short version of the book, describing community control of this. Thank you.